Good evening. Welcome to Central News for Tuesday the 17th of September. I'm Hilary Entwistle. In today's news, there has been much debate over the proposed move of ag research from its base in the Waikato to other parts of the country. Although these changes would not take place before 2016, the loss of jobs and effect on the wider community is predicted to have a very negative impact on the Hamilton community. Labour list MP Sue Moroni is against the move and says that it is crucial to fight to keep ag research in the Waikato. Well, look, the Waikato is probably one of the top dairy producing uh, areas, in fact, uh, in the whole world, but definitely in this country. And it seems to me that having the strategic ability to have cutting edge research and innovation in the agricultural space happening in the Waikato would be a really smart thing to do. Strategically, that's always been a really important advantage that our region has had. And I'm really concerned about economic development in our region should we lose that capacity. The recent decision by Bay of Plenty Regional Council to commit $18 million to a Portuguese harbour redevelopment project reflects strong regional support for the project and the benefits it will bring to the wider Bay of Plenty. The regional infrastructure funding decision secures almost half the funding needed to complete the venture and work to secure the other half is already well underway. A Portiki District Council Chief Executive Eileen Laurie says this pledge of $18 million is a massive step forward for the project and provides both financial backing and a very clear indication of regional support for the project. Real estate industry observers are saying Tauranga house prices can be expected to start climbing during the next six months as demand begins to exceed supply. Harcourt CEO Hayden Duncan says there's still quite a strong supply of listings in the Bay, but that has tightened up dramatically during the last two or three months. Harcourt's reports stock levels are down everywhere, with Auckland minus 10.2% during the last year and Christchurch at minus 23.8%, the worst affected. The central region, which includes the Waikato and Bay of Plenty, is minus 8.6%. Stock levels are almost down in Wellington, minus 3.2%, and South Island Provincial, minus 9.5%. Now for our region's weather. Hamilton fine with an easterly dying out. Your expected high is 15 and an overnight low of 3. Tauranga, you will have a fine Wednesday and the south easterly will die out. Your expected high is 16 and an overnight low of 7. Just ahead, things to see and do in Tauranga. Welcome to Central News on TV Central. There is lots on in Tauranga at the moment, but Greece is the word. Greece is the word. Love that show. So excited. We've got it here in Tauranga from the 13th to the 21st of September. It's a must mm, It is a must do. At yeah. Bay Court. Yeah. It's all pink. It's all gorgeous. Yeah. It's all go. We know all the songs. I yeah. love going to shows when you know all the songs. Now Mount Pottery is a new drop-in business. Yes, Laurie Steer is a local potter and artist well known to quite a few people. He's living at 226 Ocean Beach Road at Mount Monganui, bit of a regular route for a lot of people. Mm. And you can drop in between 10 and 4 on a Sunday and Laurie's very happy to share his space with you, have a cup of tea, bit of a chat. So yeah, it's a really funky space. So drop and in. Craftahontas is quite a complicated word, so what is that? Craft Isn't that a cool word? Mm. It's, a, it's a, a new craft shop in Tauranga. It's meet and... Meet and greet meet and, and greet over... No, meet, no, and, no, no. meet and make meet with tea and, and cake. Meet and make with tea and cake. Yeah. So that is so gorgeous. And um, just contact Creative Tauranga um, if you want to know more information about that. And it's also in our... There's a really cool article in our Creative Beat magazine. Yeah, so it's a craft club. Yeah. And they hold it in local halls here and they'll run some school holiday programmes. So, you know, we're even thinking of popping along. Oh, no, it looks so cool. Speaking of school holidays, there's a new school holidays programme. Yes. yes, that's a bit exciting. Now that's um, being held out at Bethlehem Performing Arts Centre mm -hmm. over the school holidays. And it's for the age range between 5 and 15 and of children that may not have tried 
a performing arts before. So maybe a bit of drama, a yeah. bit of jazz, a bit of hip hop, something along those lines. And Denny, yeah. you know Yeah, about what, they, that. they have a theme every holidays and um, the kids all through the week learn different parts of the show and then on the last day they, they learn the show and, they, and their parents will come along and watch them. Mm. Apparently it's spectacular. Yeah. First time to Tauranga. Mm. And what's on the gallery? In the gallery we've got Peter and Jill Wallace at the moment, a lovely couple from Tauranga, beautiful artworks mm. you'll see in the background. They're here till the September the 17th and um, I was just going to talk about our Creative Beat magazine because all the stories about what we've been mm. talking about, Grease, Craftahontas, Peter and Jill, they have some very cool stories you know, in the articles in the mag and you can download it or if you'd like it delivered to your door just contact us and we'll tell you how we can help you with that. Tauranga Waterfront Festival with Hearing McCleary. Oh, nice. Yeah, we've got so much going on. It's sort of like that little spring yeah. buzz at the moment. So on September the 28th, we have the Cherry Blossom Festival happening in Gretchen, which is just a gorgeous mm. event. Victoria does a fantastic job out there in Gretchen. And then in Tauranga from 12 noon till 7 o'clock is the opening of the waterfront summer season. Mm -hmm. So there'll be... Um, Craft, markets, food, all sorts of activity mm. going on. And of course the Harry McCleary site will be open yep. with plans of what that's looking like. We're getting closer to having our sculptures <laughs> installed. So it's getting a bit exciting it now. Is. And so we're going to have some of the look-alike dogs down there that won the competition earlier this year. There'll be some a storytelling by Tauranga Library mm. and there'll be some guest appearances by drop-in readers of Harry McCleary stories. Plus, Simon Bridges will be there with a cheque for $150,000 towards the project from the yes. government. So we are absolutely delighted about that. And yeah, just, you know, the momentum's growing. We're nearly there. Nearly We're there. nearly there. So it'll be a big celebration. What is the crowdfunding workshop? Yes. yes, here at Creative Tauranga the day before, on Friday, September the 27th, Simon Bowden from the New Zealand Arts Foundation will be in town. There is a breakfast at the Art Gallery actually that morning at 7am for $30 a head if you'd like to go and hear Simon speak about his experiences in the arts. He's a very interesting man. And then he's coming across to Creative Tauranga at 11am and 2pm we'll be running workshops on Boosted which is a new crowdfunding resource for artists. Yeah. So um, register with Creative Tauranga and we're really looking forward yeah, to that. Yeah, great. What is the SMART art strategy? The SMART <laughs> arts strategy, yeah, a bit of a tongue twister. It's a community strategy for the arts and culture sector. So it was developed in 2006. We've just recently been reviewing that. You know the landscape's changed, a mm. lot, lot going on since 2006. So we're just reviewing that at the moment and whether it's still fitting the needs of community and what some of the new initiatives might be around um, driving that out into the future. So great excitement for the arts sector at the moment, or always, but particularly at the moment because we're engaging with community and yeah, the voice is Lots. getting louder. Yeah. Why do you think it is important that we do get our youth more involved with art? Well, I think that's a no-brainer yeah. in yeah. some respects in that our yeah. youth are our future. Our youth also have a very loud voice at the moment that they're trying to feel connected to their city and their community. They have amazing initiatives going on out there that are a little bit um, siloed. So we want the wider community to see what they're doing yeah. and positive messages around our youth, not always negative. So yeah. it's a, around that side of things. And the strategy will continue to support a museum. Why? Yes, it will, because that's the voice the community are um, very loud about. Creative Tauranga leads the strategy, we listen to the community, and it's a very loud cry from the community that they still want a museum, so yeah. that is what we will lead with. To find out more about any of these events, you can visit creativetauranga.org.nz. Just ahead, money and kids. Welcome back. Should kids have pocket money? A local author has released a new book about how to raise a financial savvy generation. So in the recent global financial crisis, which generation do you think actually came off worst? Well, the crisis um, has had wide-reaching effects, to be fair, and 
I think it's the, it's the generation that are running the home that are the hardest hit at the moment. Uh, the cost of living has increased significantly. Um, interest rates are favourable, but the cost of owning a home has increased. You know, uh, we see in Auckland the average house price being six hundred and. Fifty something thousand dollars. Um, banks now require a hundred thousand dollar deposit. That's getting it's getting hard to get in. Rent is going. You know, and all, I've got friends that are paying almost six hundred dollars a week rent for a family home. So, so that generation I think has been hit the hardest. The children of those families are not suffering that much because they have quality of life. They have um, a, a safe place to live. They have food on the table, clothes to eat, and access to good schooling. So, whilst they may not have the the frilly parts of life that some previous generations have enjoyed, they don't miss it because they don't really want it, they don't need it, they don't, it's not their ambition to have more stuff. They want to know they're loved, cared for and safe. And so I think that generation's okay. The ones in the middle are really struggling and then the older generation are making do with um, the choices that they made previously. So do you think you could argue then that this uh, younger generation will actually be more money savvy because they've watched their parents struggle a little bit? I hope so Hilary and that's again my motivation for writing the book. It says how to raise a financially savvy generation. I think the next generation will make better choices. I think they'll be more focused on long term perspective which um, is not yet encouraged with government policy, but we'll do politics another day. Uh, but you know, long-term saving, retirement saving, asset ownership, investment, all those things, I think this next generation, our children, are going to be much, much better at doing that and intentional about building a platform for their children. And I mean, there's, you know, some of that middle generation is quite big on those high purchases and that kind of thing, and that's one of your chapters in your book, is want versus needs. Mm. So you know, what is, a need and what is a, a want? Yeah, we we uh, we being me and my co-author. There's two two authors that wrote this book, um, and we each wrote a different perspective on the same chapter. So chapter five is called Needs versus Wants. How do you teach your children the difference? And Amanda writes her version, and I write mine. And so you get a really good. Um, varied perspective on that. And, and my opinion is that we absolutely must teach our children from an early age the difference between what they need and what they want. And obviously needs are the first priority and wants are the icing on the cake. Um, we've all heard you know, children say, I need a new bike, I need a new doll, I need some new jeans, I, I must have those shoes. Um, you may have even said that once or twice in your life, I'm not sure, I know I have. But we need to instill that from an early age. We need to understand that our children are craving um, a framework that they can learn how to make decisions and choices. And without that framework, they float through life really doing what they want um, on a whim or on emotion rather than um, a disciplined plan. And so we can teach our children by saying, um, you know, we've got a plan to move in this area. Um, we choose, because we choose to go on holiday at Christmas to the beach, we've decided that, you know, having this um, new car is not as important to us. And, and the kids can see the difference, the consequence because of choice. Money is a limited resource for everybody. It's greater resource for some than others, but it's still limited. And so there's a difference between what I choose to do and what I'd like to do. And we need to create that connection. And that's where needs and wants is powerful. Do you need the bike or would you like it? It's an easy conversation. So I guess that brings you on to, you know, you, you can role model it to your children. So if you give them pocket money, you can you kind of teach them that, you know, do you need those lollies? Mm, yeah, pocket money is a great tool. Uh, well, let me, let me rephrase that, Hilary, because uh, Amanda and I have slightly different viewpoint in the book. Amanda's chapter, when she writes it, should kids get pocket money, she says, here are 14 reasons why my children will never get an allowance. And so she takes quite an interesting perspective on it. I'll let the readers in investigate that. My viewpoint is that pocket money can be a great learning opportunity for children to learn how to make choices. Because if you're going to give a child um, $8 pocket money, um, then you'd, I'd like you to help them to make some choices in that around what I call the three, the three um, S's, which is um, sharing, saving and spending. So that's 
in that framework, you can teach a child with $8. Um, but it's also a great tool for them learning how to get the things that are important to them, which is their goals. And um, you know, they don't have to buy their own clothing usually at, at, at eight years old, but they certainly might want to go to the movies, they might want to save up for a, a new game or an, um, an app on their um, phone, device, iPod, whatever they've got. So we give that pocket money as a resource that allows us to let them learn their own lessons. Because if mum and dad are saying, no, you can't have it, yes, you can have it, oh, look, I'll buy it for you, or grandma swoops in with a handbag full of treats, you know, the pocket money allows us to have lessons outside of that situation. And you've got a um, chapter in there about gratitude. Mm. What does that have to do with money? Well, it's my favourite subject. Is um, it's my personal belief, and I've been teaching this for a long time, that when you when you learn how to share what you have, it doesn't control you and it doesn't own you. And there's a phrase, a quote I have in this book and all my other books that say, when you give a little bit of money away first as a priority, you prove that your money is not your master. Okay? And I think we need to do that from an early age. You know, it's easy when a child has $8 pocket money, we can say to them, how much of this would you like to share? And where would you like to share it? Now, kids are over generous. And so they might say, well, I'd like to give half of it away. And so there's an interesting conversation. There's no rules on this, but, but then it's say, well, what are we going to do to help other people? And it might be they give it to a local community group, they might accumulate it to buy a gift for someone, they may give it to a church or a charity, they might um, support um, a group that your family is involved with, you know, like, um, um, like an op shop, sort of soup kitchen, fundraiser, that kind of thing. But doing that at a young age helps children see that they're not the most important person in the world. And that's a great lesson for all of us. This is a very interesting fact. Thank you very much for that. You're welcome. You can find out more about Phil's book at kidsandmoneybook.com. Coming up after the break, the benefits of going organic. If you have just joined us, welcome to Central News. The interest of organic produce in food items is increasing. At the recent avocado conference in Tauranga, the CEO of BioGrow spoke about the benefits of going organic. In the Bay of Plenty, we have about 34 certified organic producers. There may be more organic avocado growers, but those are the ones that are, have been through a certification process. So that's some of those are certified with us and some are certified with another agency. Do you think this number will increase? Well, that just depends on what the avocado industry decide to do. You know, clearly there's consumer demand for organic products internationally. We're, we're growing about 10% per year and avocados are included in that, but it's really a case of someone taking it and looking at finding the opportunity and growing the, the market. What are the benefits of going organic? Well, it's for the producer, it's about producing a safe, healthy, high quality food and there's the demand from consumers for having that safe food that they can provide to their family. How much work would be involved in converting an average avocado orchard to be certified organic? Well, I'm not the expert in that, but I've been told by the organic growers here at the conference that it's actually not that hard and that it's just really a case of a change of attitude and, and getting away from some of those quick fixes that the conventional people do. And there is, there is a time period, there's a three year period from the time that you register your orchard to when you can actually claim to be organic and then in the interim period you're going for a conversion. So then you do kind of have to wait a few seasons to start seeing profitable return? Well there's a difference between profitable and being organic so in, after the first year you can claim that you're in conversion to organics and in some markets there's a premium even for products that claim that, I'm not so sure about avocados and then once you're fully organic it does, whether you're profitable or not depends on a lot of factors from everything from you know the particular market you're operating in and how well products are marketed into there and the consumer demand for your product. What does it mean to be organic? Okay. <laughs> That's a really difficult one, yeah, I could spend a, the next six minutes telling you what organics means. Um, but generally, you know, we, we say organics is a production system and it's, it's based on four basic principles. That's around health, around care, around fairness and around um, ecology. And based on those four principles, we've got some standards that show how you can meet that for your, the way you're 
producing your products. So can you summarise those four things? So, so kind of, well, I suppose around, um, if you're talking about care, it's care for animals, so you're encompassing the animal welfare aspects, you're caring for the environment, you're caring for the soil, you're trying to work with nature, and that's how the ecology comes in, you're encouraging biodiversity. With health, it's about producing a healthy product, you're, then that includes the health of your workers too, because the less sprays means that your workers are healthy, the soil is healthier. And then um, the last one was around, Fairness, which is about um, around a lot of what you currently know under um, fair trade movement, is also encompassed on organic. So you're making sure that your your workers are well cared for. You're giving them a fair wage, looking after their needs as well. And what are the benefits of actually becoming certified? Well, certified is at the moment in New Zealand you don't need to be certified to be organic. It's a non-regulated market, but certification does have some benefits. That really is the way that you can give consumers assurances that you're being independently verified to meet agreed standards, so you, the consumer can be aware of what they're actually buying. There's also other aspects like integrity, because you're actually getting by certified. You're having someone coming onto your property to see what you're doing, so you have to stand up to scrutiny. There's also the traceability, so going, you know, we see the whole chain from right from the production right through the, the distributor right through to the retailer, so there's a traceability from, from um, the farm to the family. And then also there's the thing about product differentiation, so if you want to claim certified organic, you're actually differentiating your product from other products that are just organic or conventional. And for some markets, you actually have to be certified to claim organic as well. Can you taste the difference between uh, your average avocado and an organic one? Yeah, kind of avocado, well, I th that's probably quite subjective. You might, even if you could taste it, you might not prefer it. But we do know actually that um, that health is the biggest driver for people to buy organic. So consumers are looking for safe, healthy food, and that's why they choose organics. Not and taste is is important, but it's not the primary reason people choose organic foods. Many are producing organic avocado oils. What are the health benefits for that? Right, so um, I wasn't sure about that situation. So I actually asked one of the avocado oil producers here that's certified with us and asked him what you know his perspective was. And he said it's the same deal. It's, it's around the health. People who are choosing organic avocado oil is, is again, it's because they want to buy healthy, safe food. And the oil is that. The organic produce industry in New Zealand actually has original roots in avocado. Yeah, oh, actually we have a real avocado thing going this year at, at Fire. We just celebrated our 30th anniversary because we were established in 1983. And so we, um, this year we had green shirts, avocado shirts. We had avocado on, our, on the cover of our annual report. And the reason we did that is because our longest standing certified producer is number 10, Doug Brown, and he's an avocado grower. So he was awarded at our 30th anniversary a special recognition of the fact that he's been around for so long. And um, yeah, we sort of featured avocados this year. So it was, was the, the year of the avocado. Is there a growing demand for the organic market? Yes, um, despite the fact there's been a global financial crisis, the, the demand for organics continues to strengthen and we recently, um, our umbrella group in New Zealand Organics, Aotearoa New Zealand, recently released the report that showed that in New Zealand the demand and growth of organics had grown by 25% over the last three years, so quite a significant growth even despite the fact that there's been an international global financial crisis happening at the same time. That is the news for today. Central News will be bringing you a local body election special soon. We will be holding a forum with the mayoralty candidates from our councils. Those councils are Tauranga City, Hamilton City, Western Bay of Plenty, Matamata Piako District, South Waikato District, Waikato District, Waipa District, Waitomo District and Thames Coromandel District. We will be putting viewers' questions to the candidates, so email us or send a message on Facebook of the questions you want answered from your potential new mayor. I will be back tomorrow night with more guests from in and around our regions. I'm Hilary Entwistle. Have a lovely evening. This has been an Alpha Media production, a division of Television Media Group. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.